Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today to talk about this uh, important subject, and I very much look forward to um, an interactive session where we can exchange ideas. So uh, my aim is to put a few thoughts on the table first of all, and then uh, to open up for a good discussion afterwards. So I'll say a few brief words about the general situation, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, three of the, of the so-called BRICS, that is Brazil, India and China. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about how the rising powers are engaging and not engaging with the multilateral development system, something about the relationships between the donors and what this means for recipients, and then look forward a little bit. So just a few contextual things. This is the change in the uh, size of the various economic blocks in the world in uh, purchasing power parity terms over the last few years. And you can see the enormous increase in the so-called BRICS share of the global economy and China's enormous uh, part in that big change. And this is roughly the, the best estimates I could come up with on the size of the international cooperation programs of the five BRICS. Uh, you'll see the numbers on there. The, um, the sources of these are rather disparate, they're not totally comparable, but I think they give you some idea. China is by far and away the largest um, contributor here, and uh, as, as the JICA source says, you could double it if you added another category of Chinese flows. India is probably the second largest, then Brazil, then Russia, and then South Africa. Uh, at the same time, several of these countries are still recipients of aid. The OECD Development Assistance Committee, and this is something I'm very pleased about, uh, publishes each year an estimate of where aid is going over the next three years. And this is what it's learnt from donors on their intentions up to the year 2017. And you'll see that, somewhat counterintuitively, Brazil, China and India are all going to get more aid from the rest of the world in 2017 than they're getting today. Not something you might have thought of. Uh, you'll also see that in all cases, uh, this aid is extremely small in relation to their economies. It's vanishingly small for, for two of them. Uh, but they do continue to take part in this international exchange of finance and uh, technical, technical um, expertise. Um, so I'll go on quickly now and talk about three of the five BRICS. Uh, this is based on a series of studies which were carried out uh, through the Institute for Development Studies with uh, DFID Finance uh, under their Rising Powers in International Development program. And the way they did this was that they got local researchers, think tanks and civil society, to kind of run the rule over what was the state of the debate on international cooperation in each of the five BRICS. Uh, so I'll take you quickly through the three on which I'm going to focus, Brazil, India and China. If you've got any questions about Russia and South Africa, I'm happy to try and answer them. How does Brazil see its cooperation then? The starting point is that Brazil does not see itself as a donor, and you'll see this is a theme which will come up several times here, uh, because it believes, as a recipient of aid, that fundamentally aid is a set of asymmetric relationships in which the donor is too powerful and the recipient not enough. So the argument is that Brazil's cooperation should be different from that, and it should be what they call more horizontal. Uh, by horizontal, they I mean it's very balanced that the recipient has as much stake in this as the donor, but donor isn't telling the recipient what to do or imposing conditionality. Uh, it's observed by the, um, by the local researchers that it's all very well for the Brazilian government to say that, but when it comes to it, Brazil's a very large place and it might be cooperating with a very small African country. Is it possible to, to retain full horizontality in that sense in those circumstances? But anyway, that's the, that's the way Brazil presents it. And in Brazil in particular, and this is a little bit of a contrast to some of the others, a focus essentially on skills transfer, a very strong part of what Brazil does. Here are some numbers for Brazil. Cobradi was an attempt to uh, look across the board at Brazilian cooperation. And if you start from the bottom, you'll see the scholarships and educational cooperation, that blue line, blue box, uh, is um, <coughs> pretty steady. I mean, the, the in absolute terms, I imagine the numbers are rising slowly, though they decline proportionately. Humanitarian cooperation and peacekeeping, peacekeeping operations both went up in 2010. I think that's very much a reflection of the very important role that Brazil played in the uh, Haitian crisis and trying to deal with problems in Haiti. Um, general technical cooperation rising gradually. Multilateral 
uh, share very large to begin with, somewhat shrinking as some of these other um, operations get larger. So that's the general outline of Brazilian uh, cooperation. Where's it going? Latin America and the Caribbean, not surprisingly, is the largest part of it, but a, a steadily rising and important program in Africa. And rather strangely, I haven't got to the bottom of this, a rising program in the last year in North America and Europe, and I don't quite understand the, the basis of that, but um, that's a bit of a, an outlier. Um, one of the features of Brazil, and it's not limited to Brazil, is that not only is there no legal framework for an international cooperation program, indeed there are questions about how the part of the Brazilian constitution allows Brazil legally to provide assistance to other countries. The, the central unit, ABC, stands for the um, uh, Brazilian Agency for Cooperation, which originally was a unit in the foreign ministry which received aid from other people, is now the central technical assistance provider as well. It's got a central role, but it's got a weak budget, few staff, and not very well equipped to, um, to pull things together. And in Brazil, and this is not at all atypical of many other countries, many different ministries and agencies run their own international programs. Uh, again, many of a knowledge transfer basis. The other thing that's very interesting in Brazil, and you'll, you'll see this repeated when we get to, to China, and it will be very much the case also in South Africa, a key role for the National Development Bank, which is a huge operation. This is like the European Investment Bank in Europe. This is the Brazilian equivalent within Brazil, finances lots of infrastructure in Brazil. And it's also the, for, the, the source for export credits, the export credit system. And in Brazil, and you'll see this is a contrast to what we're going to say about India and China, these are basically non-concessional export credits. They're just doing business, um, and uh, they're not part of a subsidized program. So the private sector benefits from these export credits, but there's not much of a sort of corporate Brazilian approach, except in a few areas. And I think if you look at the huge Brazilian multinational uh, Vale, for example, which is the big mining company, if you look at some of the um, there have been some interesting investments in Mozambique in uh, agro-business, which are very much linked to Brazilian business. It's not obvious that, that you have the same kind of, of close working relationship between the private sector and government as you get in some of the others. They did a public opinion. They looked at the last public opinion survey, and this is, these are the main results. And I think the most important is that 51% of Brazilians support Brazilian cooperation, 40% against and the sort of reasons that they think the, there's a case of Brazilian cooperation are set out there. We invited everybody to look at the challenges and they come out of what I've said. A better legal framework, a stronger central agency, better information including about the development bank, better monitoring and evaluation, more knowledge of the countries where they're operating, and more trained personnel. So capacity issues, if you like, <coughs> for Brazil in taking forward its uh, policies. India, you'll find a lot of similar things here. Again, this non-conditional approach, based on India's development experience, demand-driven, mutual advantage as a contribution to India's soft power. Uh, India is not an emerging donor in any normal sense. It's been giving scholarships since the 1940s and developed a, a sustained technical cooperation program in the 60s with a very strong local regional focus. It does provide, unlike Brazil, these semi-concessional lines of credit, so you're getting money cheaper than the market. Uh, very important in their relations with Africa. Big grant program will come on too many in South Asia. Debt relief, of course, and technical assistance, which is still pretty modest. I was surprised that the numbers weren't larger for that. Here's an interesting slide from the Indian Development Corporation um, Research Program. And you'll see from that Indian aid in general has risen modestly and in the last few years quite significantly. The interesting one is the yellow line. Because India is after all able to provide expertise and so on much more cheaply than uh, a European country, the real value of Indian aid as perceived by Indian academics is actually a lot higher than the nominal value. It's a very interesting argument, has uh, certainly some validity and it's an interesting point on which to reflect as you look at comparative numbers. Geographically, this surprised me a little bit. The biggest recipient of Indian grant aid is the very large country of Bhutan. <laughs> uh, and a very strong neighbourhood effect here, as you'll see also with some other countries. You'll certainly see it for South Africa. You'll see it very, very strongly in relation to Russia. The lines of credit, which are the more commercial end of this, um, Africa being the largest recipient. I'll spare you the administration. The Indians have 
now set up quite an e what looks like quite an effective unit in the foreign ministry to manage this. Uh, and the private sector, a closer working relationship between government and business, particularly the larger companies, uh, but Indian companies feel that China is much more organised in this respect. Public opinion in India, the elite, as often in countries, are quite favourably disposed to this, but India generally seems to be quite positive, so and with a priority for reducing poverty elsewhere, despite the fact there's quite a strong commercial uh, uh, instinct within the Indian program. China, <coughs> a very consistent approach, uh, again with some of the same things we've heard about, horizontality, non-interference, mutual benefit, all words we've had already. Uh, the most recent white paper is very much about the same, uh, the same um, position. As you'll see from Brazil, China refuses to see itself as a donor, they see it very much as a South-South cooperation provider and they draw a strong distinction between the two. Uh, equal partnership. Again, like India, a very long-standing uh, program, um, <coughs> driven not least in the, in the Chinese case by the long-standing arguments between China and Taiwan over recognition. Big projects in the 70s, a pullback in the 1980s and now a very rapid development program, developing program. The numbers I've already given you, the 7.1 billion, uh, strongly bilateral, uh, very important concessional loans in the total, and uh, as, the, as I said before, if you included all the, the export credits, uh, the concessional export credits, it would be even larger. This is from a very good study that the Japanese um, research agency, a uh, research, research part of JICA have done, and this gives the numbers in, um, in more detail. And uh, if anybody wants these slides afterwards, by the way, I'm very happy to make them available so you don't have to read them all now. But you can see the, the enormous scale of this operation and the rate at which it's expanded. If you look at it compared to the OECD countries, here are the four, five largest. I've taken these figures gross because, if you like, your influence is more determined by your gross operations than by your net, which the difference being that you take out loan repayments. That particularly affects the position of Japan, where they're very large loan repayments. So Japan is a very large gross aid donor, but a much smaller net aid donor. You'll see how China, the dotted line just off the bottom, how China is gradually, well, speedily catching up with the others. And if you more or less doubled that to deal with these preferential export credits, the Chinese program would be of similar dimensions to that of France. Uh, you'll also see the UK just reaching 0.7% with a, a boost in its final year. Um, China, unlike India, has had a much more global approach to its aid. So China has much stronger relationships with other parts of the world than would be the case with either Brazil or, or India, though it still has a strong influence in its own region. Administration a pretty stable set of institutions. I'll skip through this because it's, uh, we can always talk about it in more detail later. Again, the Ex Export-Import Bank, crucial institution for the concessional loans, and the China Development Bank, the equivalent of the Brazilian one, also an important player now. Um, skip through that. China has this more this closer relationship between government and industry, whether it's state-owned enterprises or in some cases the private sector, and China is typically offering a country say we will build you this road and then Mofcom, the ministry, will then go and find a Chinese company or state-owned enterprise which will build the road and the road is then built as a turnkey job and there's the road. So it's an, it's an internally focused process, the aid is tied in the, in the technical sense, uh, and it, it, but it does involve often a competitive process within China to decide who should actually do the job. Challenges in China, this is as assessed by the Chinese researchers, uh, can China maintain its ostensible non-interference as, it, as its investments become larger? This has already been an issue in relation, for example, to the Sudan. Uh, the researchers feel the institutional context is complex and uh, there's a capacity issue in China as elsewhere. Personally, I think that it's, it's not that complex and I think it works, so I'm not clear that there's the same pressure as there might be in Brazil to rationalise the situation further. Researchers think that triangular cooperation, cooperation with traditional donors remains a viable option for China. And <clears throat> they point to potential dilemma, and this, I've picked the same up in Brazil, between the, how the, uh, the state-owned enterprises and the uh, private sector may want to operate and the, uh, the way the government would like to operate. And that there could be, as they say, a potential gap between policy and practice in that area. <coughs> 
some points of similarity. Uh, as you've seen from the three I've mentioned, this very strong feeling about South-South cooperation being a different, a different animal altogether from North-South cooperation, based on mutual benefit rather than conditionality. For, certainly for India and China, the importance of the semi-concessional uh, operations as opposed to highly concessional operations and the case of, um, of Brazil non-concessional uh, flows as well uh, because uh, you have to bear in mind that for all these countries there may be rising powers but their budgets are very constrained so what do you do when you have a constrained budget you can provide technical cooperation it's not very expensive and you can provide semi-concessional lending because you just having to subsidize a loan which is much cheaper than having to uh, give a grant so that's why I think all donors, as they start, tend to start with fairly non-concessional, fairly non-concessional flows and quite a high proportion of technical assistance. All the countries are coping with having to cope with rapid expansion of activities, which is putting some pressure on the system. A debate is starting in some of the countries on how best to manage this, and uh, this, of course, injected a little bit by the people writing the studies, a wish on the part of civil society and the academic sector to be better consulted on policy. But many points of difference as well. Where there's, a, there's certainly an emerging debate in countries like Brazil and India about what sort of cooperation do we want to have. I don't think you'll find that if you went to Russia or China. The balance of bilateral and multilateral is quite different. The balance of the near abroad, as in the Indian case, and the wider reach, as in the Chinese case, uh, is quite marked. Uh, the extent to which cooperation is centralized, on the whole, in China and now I think in India, are, 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 degree of centralization, Brazil rather the other extreme. Um, the extent of close planning with the private sector and state-owned enterprises. And what's going to happen next? We're in a situation where we're seeing a somewhat tougher environment for the, uh, for the BRICS and other rising powers. Will they want to sustain the rate of growth of their cooperation as their economies come under greater pressure? In the Brazilian case, for example, it, it does seem that the push that President Lula had for international cooperation dropped off under his successor and it would be interesting to see what sort of priority these countries give to international cooperation as they have to make perhaps some rather more constrained fiscal choices. Now briefly the multilateral system. I go back to the slide I showed you earlier about the rapid increase of the BRICS share of the world economy. Now contrast this with the evolution of the BRICS share of governance and votes in the World Bank over the same period. It's a pretty stark contrast, isn't it? So apart from some increase in China's voting share in the World Bank, the BRICS basically have hardly got any more. The Europeans, who share the world economy has shrunk markedly between 2007 and 2013, are still account for nearly 30% of the votes on the World Bank board. This is not a good reflection of where the world is at the moment, and it sets up a series of very uh, obvious tensions. If you look at what the BRICS have been contributing to three big multilateral um, replenishments took place uh, in the end of 2013. You can see that, first of all, apart from the increase in China's contribution to IDA, which is quite significant, uh, most of the contributions, even if they increase, are extremely small. And in some cases, as in Brazil for IDA or Russia for the Global Fund, they've decreased. Uh, and if you contrast those with the total amount that the OECD Development Assistance Committee countries and other EU members are putting in, it's extremely, uh, it doesn't bear much relationship to the growing share of the BRICS in the world economy. And that, to my mind, comes back very much to what kind of voice do these people have in the boards of these institutions? And how far do they think that the multilateral system is or isn't working for them, or isn't simply something that's been created by the West and which they feel less affinity? And if you look at the last five big replenishments, that's the World Bank Soft Fund, the African Development Bank Soft Fund, the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria, and very recently, two very important ones, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, and the Green Climate Fund, which is the Korean-based um, new fund. Uh, this is their first raising of funds. They raised 10 billion uh, for uh, climate change, and everything goes with that. You will see that Europe, in different ways is the largest contributor to all, though the proportions vary. The Americans, uh, which is the largest part of US, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, who I've grouped together here, are uh, very big supporters of the Global Fund, a uh, very significant contribution to the Green Climate Fund, much less so proportionately to IDA 
uh, and uh, still less to the others. Japan and Korea, um, proportionately the biggest in the Green Climate Fund, perhaps not surprisingly as it's located in East Asia. But the most important one I want to draw your attention to is the non-DAC. Uh, this is where China and everybody else would be placed. It's almost can barely be measured in most of these and in the case of the Green Climate Fund I will tell you because I went through the figures the only, only non-DAC countries contributing to the Green Climate Fund are four I think small Latin American countries like Peru and Panama not a single one of the BRICS is a contributor as things stand to the Green Climate Fund and it shows that even when you've got a governance system which is being explicitly designed to be much more balanced than, um, than before the extent of buy-in to multilateral to existing multilateral institutions by these countries is not very great. Uh, just a little bit of background information on uh, where multilateral aid is going. In the case of Brazil, IDA is a big part of this. The UN, PAHO is part of the is the Western Hemisphere arm of the World Health Organization, and FOSEM is the local regional bank for the Southern Cone countries. So this is operating in Brazil's backyard, as it were. Uh, China, this is an interesting contrast to the one I showed you earlier about where China's bilateral aid is, and you'll remember that China's bilateral aid was up here somewhere, uh, creeping up towards the others. In this case, although it's just got ahead of Korea, it's, um, it's still very modest. And again, you'll see um, how the UK managed to reach its 0.7% target in 2013. Uh, in fact, the UK's contribution to multilaterals is, uh, is strikingly large. If you compare the, Uni the United Kingdom and the United States, uh, it is really re quite remarkable uh, how the, um, the balance has, uh, has moved. Uh, but I think China is really interesting here because although China has given a little bit more money to IDA, it's not given much to anybody else, but it has at the same time signed up some really significant numbers. Uh, $2 billion for the African Development Bank, I think it's two billion for the Inter-American Bank, and I think it's three billion for the IFC over a period of years, five, five, six years in each case. And this is money which isn't coming from the Chinese taxpayer, it's coming from Chinese reserves. And China is investing this money in parallel financing operations with these three institutions on which its share of the soft fund is very small. Um, and it's getting a return on these because it's going to lend on the same terms as the bank. So in the African case, the money is available in parallel with the African Development Bank's financing. It's untied, it's used according to African Development Bank procurement rules, it's not just for Chinese procurement. Uh, and by lending in parallel, the Chinese have a very strong assurance that they'll be repaid. And they're getting a return on the money, which is not colossal, but it's probably better than they, a lot better than they're getting on US Treasury bonds. And it's diversifying their portfolio. So it's a very interesting example of how it worked together. And the Chinese have also been instrumental in pushing forward for these new institutions. We've now got the new, new Development Bank, agreed by the BRICS at their summit in uh, Brazil last year, uh, starting work shortly with an Indian uh, executive director. And uh, very importantly, the Asia Inter uh, Investment um, Bank, which is a kind of, could be seen as a Chinese answer to the, Asia, the existing Asian Development Bank. China is, of course, a member of the Asian Development Bank, but uh, I think the average outsider would say that the Asian Development Bank is dominated by Japan and the United States. Uh, and this is, if you like, is China and a lot of other Asian countries, including from the Middle East, getting another institution together. And again, their ambitions for the, their various Silk Road transportation uh, schemes. Uh, finally, um, for the donors, um, we have a number of categories. There are those countries who are part of the OECD Development Assistance Committee or sort of part of that ecology, like, say, Central European countries. Uh, the South-South Cooperation, which is not aligned to the DAC, which is where the Brazilians, uh, uh, Indians and Chinese will find themselves. And there is, at the same time, it seems to me there are two things going on. There's cooperation, quite a lot of cooperation. The Japanese, for example, have long pushed and uh, quite successfully for using their funds in triangular cooperation with Brazil and others in, uh, around the world. Uh, and there's an increasing amount of this going on. It makes a pretty good sense if you can manage it. And there's a lot of mutual learning going on. Uh, you, a lot of um, discussion of how to do things better and a lot of exchange, particularly between China and the DAC. There was a big China DAC study group which looked at different practices, what works, what doesn't work, what can we learn from China's experience and so on. So a very constructive side of cooperation. At the same time there's competition for power and influence. Uh, 
uh, undoubtedly this is the case if you're a large financier or anything you immediately get involved in that and commercial advantage so there's a complex relationship between the rising powers and the existing ones the traditional ones uh, the crucial question to my mind is what's going to deliver a better outcome for recipient countries and um, we don't have time to we might go into this more in discussion and uh, Alistair you might well comment on this but from a recipient point of view it clearly helps to break the quasi monopoly of the OECD countries uh, and the Chinese model in particular gives you lots of things which you haven't perhaps had before it's it's very friendly to a government uh, growth strategy which wants more infrastructure that's what China's particularly good and competitive at it's what traditional donors are being very cautious about because it's um, for a whole series of reasons they tend to like the social sectors uh, so Chinese fit a model there and the Chinese deliver the Chinese are quick they don't hang around once you've negotiated it gets done so that's the strength side the weakness uh, occasionally is that deals are done at a fairly political level the projects after all that, that are offered to the Chinese maybe the projects that nobody else wanted to do and there may be some reason why nobody else wanted to do them maybe they're not very economically viable for example so and also there's a question of whether some of the deals that involve uh, links to other parts of the economy like as it were mineral revenues or something how transparent that process is and whether you're getting a fair deal and of course anybody who's borrowing money needs to be sure that they're borrowing money for productive purposes otherwise over time you get into difficulty and then there's a good good uh, forum being created by China and Africa at regional levels I think those are going to be increasingly important internationally um, there was a the OECD DAC started out in the early 2000s on a looking more carefully at aid effectiveness and in 2005 they created the so-called Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness in which they tried to stress ownership and alignment so you tried to give the the host country a greater say in the overall scheme of things harmonization to reduce the cost of um, transactions with lots of different donors and uh, a focus on results and more mutual accountability a sort of grown-up relationship if you like between recipients and donors um, in parallel the UN set up a development cooperation forum which looks at aid including south-south cooperation um, in Pusan in uh, 2011 a forum on um, development effectiveness brought together rather successfully and I think the Korean um, the way the Koreans managed this was a uh, model really uh, it brought together a sort of consensus with everybody including the South main South South cooperation countries about some of the elements of development effectiveness as it was then called and that set up a thing called the global partnership for effective development cooperation which is the GPEDC which is now being uh, co-chaired by the Dutch and the Indonesians um, and one other country which I've forgotten uh, and which met in Mexico uh, in April last year one of the questions is whether this global partnership in which the the BRICS um, notably the uh, the three we've talked about have kept their distance I would say whether this has a future as a, a vehicle for stressing the cooperation rather than the competition side between the traditional donors and the uh, rising powers in my view it's a somewhat unstable equilibrium so we're now coming to uh, the sustainable development goals which are going to run to 2030 um, there will be a major financing for development conference under UN auspices in Addis Ababa in uh, July uh, this harks back to the well-known conference in Monterey in 2002 where, where the key takeaway from Monterey was a recognition that development was not just about aid but tax came into it fi fi uh, private investment remittances and a, a more broad view of development finance but concessional transfers are still important for shared objectives and particularly for low income and least developed and fragile states and just to show you that very quickly this is aid look at the red bar it's not significant for middle income countries but it's highly significant for low income countries so what can we do I think the one thing that we could do constructively I don't uh, say it's going to happen is that we would it would be nice to have better and more consistent accounting for all forms of concessional finance from all governments for these sustainable development purposes so we can see what's monitor what's happening up to 2030 at the moment we've got an OECD system we've got a less well developed UN system and we've got the beginnings of open access through the International Aid Transparency Initiative and a US based uh, operation called Aid Data it would be very nice if the Financing for Development Conference could agree to establish a UN system for official reporting on all these flows 
on a consistent and transparent basis, uh, the OECD would have basically to finance it because the UN hasn't got the Secretary of Resources to do it at the moment, and it would need very careful agreement on what is actually covered and what are the key concepts, and all governments would have to agree to report under it, which is uh, a big ask. Uh, it would be crucial that it doesn't affect targets or their coverage. I think one of the concerns of Brazil and co is that don't hold us to account for the 0.7% target, that's for you guys in the north, and all South-South cooperation providers will very reasonably resist these kind of across-the-board targets, which are quite inappropriate for poorer countries anyway. Um, the likelihood, however, is I don't think it's going to happen. Thank you. <laughs>